are continuing through our process here. Uh, again, just to give you a sort of layout of the day so you know how this fits, as I told you, uh, for me, um, the, the observation takes the better part of the morning on my study day. Now, let me just say, someone asked about this, and let me just say that uh, you, obviously some of these things have to be in this exact order. You're not going to meditate on something you haven't studied yet. So meditation has to follow observation at some point. However, let's take evaluation, where you're going to use your commentaries to double check what, you know, to, to gain additional insight, to check what you've studied. Could you do that before meditation? Of course. So if, and sometimes I do that, you know, if, if the actual step two goes faster in the morning and I have time, I'll start, I'll start reading through commentaries before lunch and, and begin that process of evaluation. My better commentaries so that, you know, when I go on my walk, I've, I've already, again, I've gotten as much in my head, as much digested as possible. Um, so you, you can vary this. You can't obviously interpret. You can't make a final interpretation until I believe you have both observed and meditated. So interpretation has to follow those, but you could move evaluation around a little bit in terms of when you use the commentaries. Just don't do it before you do observation. All right. You want to do your own work first. So you see what I'm saying? It's not like these are set in stone and you can't sort of adapt this to your own temperament and, and you know, desires and time and everything else. But, but generally, A, you have to include all these elements and B, generally it'll follow this flow. Okay? All right, any, any more questions before we begin interpretation about meditation or observation or anything we've looked at so far or just generally how this, how this works? Okay, then let's go on to interpretation. I have to tell you, a couple of years ago, uh, it's been probably three years ago now, I was teaching my daughters in our own family Bible time the basics of Bible study. Our they're teenagers, and, and I wanted them to get a, a feel for, you know, they're studying the Bible on their own. Fortunately, they get a lot of that through our youth group. They do, they do read-throughs, Bible read-throughs, and they have questions to answer and, and all of that. So they get a little feel for that. They're, we're trying to train our, our youth to do that on a personal basis. But I wanted to, to be involved in that with them as well. I, I wanted them to understand how many Christians abuse the Bible but I didn't want to just say that. I wanted to sort of illustrate it for them. So I landed on the idea of a kind of enacted parable. And so one morning after breakfast, you know, it's our normal Bible time. And, and uh, I, I told them that we were going to do something a little different this morning. I said, uh, you know, I read an article in the Dallas Morning News this morning that really encouraged me spiritually. And I want to share it with you. And I'm, I'm dead serious. You know, they... As far as they know, this is exactly what we're going to do. I said, so you don't need to bring your Bibles this morning. Instead, I'm going to read an article from the newspaper, and I'm going to make a few comments on it. And so there was an article on the front page of the Dallas Morning News that day about an aging rock group that had appeared down at the American Airlines Center in Dallas. I think it was the Eagles, if I remember right. And, uh, and, and I began to read this article about the Eagles' performance down at the American Airlines Center. And periodically, as I read, I would stop and begin to sort of wax eloquent about the spiritual lesson that was there in that section I had just read. Uh, lessons, by the way, that had nothing to do with what the original author intended. For example, the article mentioned that, that they had worn suits for the concert. It seemed a little different for the Eagles. but So I, so I eagerly explained that, you know, this is, a, this is a great reminder that, that we really ought to dress up when we go to worship. Yeah, and why? You know, I explained, I sort of pontificated on why that was important. And I found other spiritual lessons in this article as we sort of went down through it that were, you know, really deep spiritually. Now, when I first started this, my daughters, I mean, they trust me. They know what I do. And, you know, I'm a pastor. And so initially when I told them this is what we're going to do, they're all, okay, great. Let's, let's hear. But it wasn't very long into this little exercise that, 
they begin to have these little quizzical looks on their faces. And after a while, they started looking very confused. And, and it was funny to watch because they started making these sort of uncomfortable glances at each other. And like, dad's losing it. And, and I stopped and I said, what? I mean, what's bothering you guys? And carefully and respectfully, to their credit, they said, one of my, my oldest daughter actually said, Dad, I, I don't think that's what that article means, which was exactly what I wanted. So you know what I said. I gave them the classic Christian response. Well, that's what it means to me. At this point, with sort of growing exasperation, one of my girls said, Dad, you can't do that. <laughs> and of course, I agreed. And then I turned and helped them see that what I had just done to the Dallas Morning News is what Christians do to God's eternal word all the time. They wrest it from its context, and they make it say whatever they want it to say. You've heard messages like this. I hate to say it, but if we look in our past far enough, we've preached messages like that. We do not give the Bible meaning. It means something whether we get it or not. It means, just like that article in the Dallas Morning News, exactly what the author intended it to mean. We must not only determine what the Bible says as students and pastors, we must also determine what it means by what it says. Observation gave us what it says, but there are, as we've already seen, interpretive decisions that have to be made. What does it mean? Most of us understand the principle of private interpretation of Scripture. Because of the influence of the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century, this was an absolutely revolutionary idea. In fact, listen to what Trent said. This is the Council of Trent on private interpretation. Quote, To check unbridled spirits, it, that is this council, decrees that no one, no person, relying on his own judgment shall in matters of faith and morals pertaining to the edification of Christian doctrine, distorting the Holy Scriptures in accordance with his own conceptions, presume, no one notice, shall presume to interpret them contrary to that sense which the Holy Mother Church, to whom it belongs to judge of their true sense and interpretation, has held or holds, are even contrary to the unanimous teaching of the fathers, even though such interpretations should never at any time be published. In other words, not only can you not publish an interpretation contrary to what the church has taught? You can't have one. You have no right, Trent said, to ever make an interpretive decision about the text. Instead, you must let the church, specifically in Catholic theology, who with whom or with what group resides the power to interpret the Bible? The magisterium. The magisterium has the right to interpret the Bible. Here's the catechism of the Catholic Church. The task of interpreting the Word of God authentically has been entrusted solely. Let me read that again. The task of interpreting the Word of God authentically has been entrusted solely to the magisterium of the church. That is to the Pope, and to the bishops in communion with him. End quote. That's what the Reformation was fighting against. That's where sola scriptura came from. The ultimate authority is not the magisterium. It's not what the popes and the bishops say it means. The ultimate authority resides in the scripture alone. This issue was at the core of the Protestant Reformation. Contrast Council of Trent with Martin Luther's statement at the Diet of Worms in 1521. Unless I am convinced, notice this, by, uh, and notice how he begins, unless I am convinced, 
personally, individually. By the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, and by that he means either it has to be chapter and verse or it can be legitimately deduced by clear reason from the text. For I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. History is rife with that. I mean, at one point, as you know, there were three popes. I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand. God help me. You see the contrast. You see why this whole concept of interpretation is so dear, should be so dear to us. This is what the Reformation was fought about. The Bible means something, but not only is the leadership of the church responsible to determine what that means, somebody off in Rome somewhere, but I have a responsibility to interpret the scripture, and to live in keeping with the scripture. Now, the presupposition behind private interpretation is this, the perspicuity of scripture. God has given his people a book they can understand, a book they can understand. Now, let me just hasten to add what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that everything is easy to understand. I mean, Peter says, There are things hard to understand in Paul. It doesn't mean that we don't have to study. The Westminster Confession (coughs) says, we come to understand the scripture, quote, through the use of ordinary means. We can understand the scripture, but it's not like this sort of osmosis. You put the Bible under your pillow and go to sleep and you understand it the next morning. No, you use the ordinary means. That is reading it, hearing it read, hearing it taught, personal study, using the tools that have been offered to us. That's how you come to understand it. But let me also say that while God has given us a book we can understand, it doesn't mean that we can come to a right knowledge of it or grasp its richness in entirety without the illumination of the Spirit. We talked about that already this morning. Nor does it mean, and this is really important, private interpretation does not mean that we can come up with our own interpretation unique from the rest of the church. Charles Hodge writes this, if the scriptures be a plain book and the spirit performs the function of a teacher to all the children of God, it follows inevitably that they must agree in all essential matters in their interpretation of the Bible. And from that fact, it follows that for an individual Christian to dissent from the faith of the universal church, i.e. the true body of believers, is tantamount to dissenting from the scriptures themselves. You hear what Hodge says? He says, if, if you come up with an interpretation that puts you at odds with the spirit-illuminated body of believers throughout the history of the church, then you ought not question them, you ought to question yourself. Because if the the Bible's a book that can be understood, and if all believers have the Holy Spirit, and if the Holy Spirit has illumined their understanding, then if you come to a unique interpretation, what makes you think that the, the truth has suddenly dawned upon your balding pate. You know, that's contrary to the whole indication of how the Spirit works. So we're not saying, and this is, what, this is kind of how the Catholic Church caricatured private interpretation. You can just make it say anything you want to say. That is absolutely not what we're saying. What we are saying is that we have a responsibility in this area. What we deny And here's what Sola Scriptura denied. Here's what the Reformation denied. Here's what we deny is that Christ has appointed anyone or any group to whose interpretation we are bound to submit as the final authority. Okay? The fact that we reject what Rome teaches doesn't mean 
let me, let me make this very clear, doesn't mean that a church can have a shared understanding of God's word. In other words, a doctrinal statement. Nor does it mean that a group of leaders in a church can't say, you have to agree in principle with our understanding of the scripture in order to be in leadership in this church. Because in that scenario, they aren't saying before God, you have to embrace our interpretation. All they're saying is to be in leadership in this church, you have to be in essential agreement with what we believe the Bible teaches. Those are two different things. That's not what the Catholic Church was saying. The Catholic Church was saying, you can't even hold to something contrary to the, our interpretation. So, let's talk about the arguments for private interpretation. Why do we even know this is valid for us to do? Arguments for private interpretation. Number one, the obligations for faith and obedience are personal and judgment will be personal. Okay, the number of texts, take uh, Ezekiel 18, the soul who sins, it will die. Matthew, Matthew 19, 14, Jesus says, this is a really telling statement. He says it a number of times. Have you not read? What's the implication of that statement? The scriptures can be understood. They can be comprehended. And he's not saying, have you not read? I mean, the Pharisees really, of course they had read. He wasn't saying, have your eyes not passed over the text? Haven't you considered it? What was he really saying when he said, have you not read? Yeah, you, you haven't comprehended. You haven't made the right interpretive decision. And he was holding them accountable for that. That's what I want you to get. He was holding them accountable, not only for reading, but for making the right interpretive decision. Secondly, and and I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but I just want to touch on them. Secondly, the scripture is almost always addressed to the people and not merely to the leadership. Addressed to God's people. The prophets constantly said, hear, O Israel, or listen, all you people. Christ taught whom? The multitudes. Most of the epistles of the New Testament were addressed to the congregation and were commanded to be read to the congregation. Thirdly, people are called upon to study the scripture personally and to teach it to their children. Scripture is commands God's people to do this. Obviously, Deuteronomy 6, you're to, you're to let these, the truths of what God has revealed be in your heart. That's meditation. That's thinking about it. And you are to teach these things to your children. And you're to do it formally. You're to do it informally. What does that imply? There are decisions that you will make about the meaning of as you explain that text to others. But I think here's the key argument for private interpretation. God's people are called upon. We could say that in the, in the active voice. God calls upon his people and God praises his people for evaluating what they hear against the teaching of Scripture authoritative teaching they hear, they are to evaluate themselves against the scripture. They're called to do that. They're praised for doing that. Deuteronomy 13, you remember as Moses lays down the criteria for a true prophet. In in Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 3, he calls upon the people to evaluate what a prophet says against previous revelation even if they do a miracle that comes true. He says, so what? Evaluate what they say against previous revelation. And if it isn't there, if if it doesn't uh, reflect previous revelation, then they're a false teacher. Don't listen to them, even if they performed a miracle. So what is that calling those people to do? They're called to measure what they hear a guy say against what the scripture says. 
that requires them to have made an interpretation of what the scripture says. Of course, the, the most famous one, turn there, Acts 17. This one is, I think, it's monumental. It's huge. Luke, writing under the inspiration of the Spirit and obviously under the auspices of the Apostle Paul, says this in, in Luke 17, 11. Now these were more noble, that is the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. More noble-minded. This is inspired praise. In contrasting these two groups of people, under inspiration, Luke says, the Bereans were more noble-minded for, because, here's why, they received the word with great eagerness examining the scriptures daily. Notice this, whether these things were so. They, they compared what an authoritative teacher told them against what the scripture said. That means they have made an interpretive decision about what the scripture says, and they're evaluating what that person, that person's interpretation against the scripture. Now, what's remarkable about this is who's teaching? Paul, the apostle Paul. So God, through the Holy Spirit here, is praising the Bereans for evaluating the interpretation of the apostle Paul against the scripture. Think about Galatians 1. Galatians 1, turn there with me. You're, again, a very familiar passage, but Galatians 1, verse 8. Even if we, that is Paul, he's kind of the royal we there, me and my tapeworm. If, if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As, I, as we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, there's that, that New Testament language of, of the, the, the reception of the, the apostolic tradition, he is to be accursed. He's to be damned. Let him be anathema. Let him be damned. Now, again, notice what's being said here. This implies, one, that the people had a right to evaluate the teaching of an apostle or even an angel. In other words, if, if Paul, if verifiably the apostle Paul showed up in this room this morning and he were teaching you the Bible, you would have a responsibility before God to compare what he taught you against the scripture because he's just a man. And even apostles at times sinned in their application and understanding of scripture. Galatians 2, right, Peter? Compromise the gospel. At that moment, that, by the way, that was the darkest moment in church history at the very beginning of the church because in, in Galatians 2, only one man stood against a false gospel. The rest of everybody else was going along. Only Paul. So, it implies the people had a right to evaluate the teaching of an apostle or an angel. If Gabriel showed up here, think about this. This is what Paul is saying. If verifiably, if we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, it was Gabriel here teaching us what God wanted us to know. What, were you, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to compare what he says against the scripture, against what's been revealed. And he says, throw them out. Let them be damned. If I show up and I preach something contrary to the scripture, if Gabriel shows up and teaches something contrary to the scripture, throw us out. So this implies the people had a right 
and responsibility to evaluate the teaching of an apostle or an angel. And what else does it imply? It implies they had an infallible rule to use in that, in, in that evaluation, the scripture. Hodge writes, if then the Bible recognizes the right of the people to judge the teaching of apostles and angels, they are not to be denied the right of judging of the doctrines of bishops and priests. Look at uh, one other text, 2 Corinthians. By the way, let me just say, if you haven't run up against this yet, you will. In talking with Catholics, this is one of their big things. You have no right to evaluate the Scripture on your own. So, you, you know, what you tell me the Scripture means or what I read it and think it means is of no consequence because I'm not given that privilege. That belongs to the magisterium. How are you going to answer that? So you answer that. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God. Now watch this. But by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul says, here's my ministry. I manifest, I, I make a display of the truth. I, I reveal the truth in my teaching. And what I'm really doing in that is commending that truth and our own integrity to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I'm calling upon them to receive that truth in the principle of private interpretation. They hear my teaching. They do what I commend through Luke, my, my physician, and that is it's noble-minded to examine the scriptures to see if what I said is true. Charles Hodge again writes, the Bible is a plain book. It is intelligible by the people, and they have the right and are bound to read and interpret it for themselves so that their faith may rest on the testimony of the Scripture and not on that of the church. So, there are the arguments for private interpretation. Let's talk about the importance of interpretation in the process of our preaching and our preparation. Why is interpretation so important? Because, listen to this, only the true meaning of the passage is in fact the word of God. Only the true meaning of the passage is in fact the word of God. Peter makes this very clear. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Now watch this. So, so Paul writes under inspiration. There are things in those inspired letters that are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort. And then he says, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, to their own destruction. Only what the author intended to communicate is the Scripture. Anything else is a distortion. You see that? It's a distortion. Of the truth. It's not the truth. So to miss the point of the passage is to present your people something less than the Word of God. Now, let me tell you what pastors do. And unfortunately, this is not uncommon. They come to a text. They don't invest the time and effort they should invest and they say something from that text that is biblically true. It's somewhere else in the Bible. It just isn't what that text is saying. Is that okay? Is it okay if you preach a message that doesn't really reflect the passage you claim to be preaching, but it's still true, it's God's truth, and it's somewhere else in the Bible? Is that okay? No, that's not okay. I love this quote from John Broadus. It is so common to think that whatever kindles the imagination and touches the heart 
must be good preaching. <laughs> Let me read that again. You got to hear that. Okay, listen. It's so common to think that whatever kindles the imagination and touches the heart must be good preaching, and so easy to insist that the doctrines of the sermon are in themselves true and scriptural, though not actually taught in text, that preachers often lose sight of their fundamental and inexcusable error, fundamental and inexcusable, of saying that a passage of God's word means what it does not in fact mean. Just let that settle in your soul for a moment. Imagine standing before Christ one day, knowing in your soul that you taught a passage and you didn't worry about what it meant. You simply wanted to make sure that you were teaching the truth and so you just said something true. But you, a mouthpiece for God, took it upon yourself to make a passage say something that it doesn't say. That is a fundamental and inexcusable error. When we, in, when we misinterpret a text, let me say it really clearly. When we misinterpret a text, our interpretation is not Scripture. We're not teaching the Scripture. If we misinterpret that text, we are not teaching the Scripture. Even if that truth appears somewhere else. We're still not teaching the scripture at that point because the meaning of the scripture is the scripture. I mean, do you think that, you know, that Jehovah's Witness that shows up at your door and he takes John 1 1 and says, In the beginning was a God? Is that the scripture? No, you don't believe that's the scripture. He has just twisted and distorted the scripture into something that's anti scripture even though he's quoting it. There is, guys, there is not a hair's breadth of difference between that and our standing in the pulpit and saying something that, in our case, is true from somewhere else in Scripture, but isn't what that text is saying. Yeah. Blend over to things mentioned, make a big deal about that in the text, that's not the point of the text. Right. Would yeah. that be similar to this, or are you getting further? Yeah, no, I, I think we're talking further. You know, his question is, can you, can you make this misstep by, by getting carried away with a doctrine that's in your passage, but maybe taking people too far afield from that passage? Uh, could you? Sure. I mean, you know, if something is barely mentioned and you spend the next three weeks somewhere else dealing with it, then yeah, you're not really reflecting that passage. But that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you're basically careless, when you don't do a, a a good job of interpreting. Either you've been lazy, you haven't done the preparation, the work, and you stand up and just sort of off the cuff say what you want to say. And, you know, a lot of guys do that. You know what, we, you know what they're called, right? Saturday night specials. You've heard of the handgun, the Saturday night special. Well, the Saturday night specials sermons are just as deadly. When guys do that, that's not the scripture. Even if it's true, it's not the scripture. You've misrepresented God. So interpretation is absolutely foundational. The meaning of the scripture is the scripture. Uh, I mentioned John 1.1 1, 1, and the Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, what about the charismatics who go to Mark 16.18 and talk about handling snakes? We ought to be able as Christians to handle snakes. There's still people in the backwoods of, you know, the Appalachians who do that. That's, is that the scripture? No, that's not the scripture. That's an utter distortion. And as Peter says, they do so to their own destruction. <laughs> Literally. Uh, 3 John 2. Look at 3 John 2. This is a favorite passage of the prosperity gospel, guys. 3 John 2. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper. And be in good health, just as your soul prospers. See, God wants you to be healthy and wealthy and be married to Victoria Osteen. <laughs> no, that's a distortion. And to make the text say that 
is to present something that isn't the scripture. It's, it's like using a Ouija board. You're using the Bible to make it say whatever you want. All right, so let's go on then. That's the importance of interpretation. Let's go on to the meaning of interpretation. Bible study, and we've talked about this several different ways, but Bible study has essentially three objectives. One, what does it say? We do that in observation. It's a science, okay? It's, It's following hermeneutics. The science for determining the meaning of a passage is exegesis, And in that process, using hermeneutics. What's hermeneutics? Well, the word for hermeneutics comes from the name for the Greek god Hermes. This is why it's called hermeneutics. Do you know this? The Greek god Hermes. Hermes was the messenger of the gods. He was responsible to explain what the gods were saying to human beings. So hermeneutics, this is where the the word was originally framed is the process through which we determine the meaning of a passage. So, what does it say? What does it mean? That's interpretation. That's where we are. And the third part of Bible study is, what am I supposed to do with this? That's application. That, that's really what we're after in all of this. What does it say? What does it mean? What am I supposed to do with it? Now, interpretation is the process of deciding what the passage actually means, making the interpretive decisions that have to be made. Hermeneutics has to do with the principles or rules by which we make those interpretive decisions. Now, first, in interpretation, you have to study it using the steps we've talked about in observation. Then you meditate on it, and then you're ready to interpret it. Maybe you read your commentaries first, you sort of moved to valuation earlier, that's okay, but those things have happened and you're ready to interpret. To actually pull your study and your meditation together and make whatever interpretive decisions need to be made about what that passage actually means. Interpretation then, we could define this way. Interpretation is the proper use of generally accepted principles hermeneutical principles, to determine the one divinely intended meaning of the passage. That's interpretation. The proper use, obviously not the misuse, the proper use of those hermeneutical principles to determine the one divinely intended meaning of the passage. This is what God intended this passage to mean. That's interpretation. But how do we go about making such a critical decision. Well, let me just say that the finer points of interpretation uh, can can be an art. It's it's not all science. There are, even as you've seen as we've looked through the text, there, there are some challenging decisions that have to be made. So it's not like Greek is gonna solve every interpretive challenge for you. It's not like Hebrew is gonna solve every interpretive challenge. You're gonna have those challenges every week you study the Word of God, every week you teach, you're going to have hurdles that you have to jump. The real work, however, in interpretation, thankfully, is more of a science than it is an art. There are objective rules to interpreting. There are rules or guidelines that we can learn and we can use to help us decide exactly what a passage means. What it doesn't mean and what it can never mean, okay? There are rules and guidelines we can follow. What I want to go next to then are those principles. Now, there are, there are volumes that have been written on hermeneutics, on, on principles of interpretation. In fact, what are, what are some of the textbooks you use here? Some of you have had hermeneutics. What are a couple of the key ones? Zuck, Zuck has a, as a book on, on hermeneutics. What's another? What is it? Evangelical hermeneutics. Any others? What is it? Grasping God's Word. Who's the author of Grasping God's Word? Okay. So those are some. There are some others. That we, when I was in seminary, sort of the classic work was Bernard Ram's uh, Biblical Interpretation. We were talking yesterday, it's interesting, um, 
I had the privilege of having lunch with the faculty of the seminary, uh, and John was there. We were talking about this very issue of hermeneutics. It's interesting because the question that came up is, is there one textbook that you would say that is the, in, in today's world with all the, the sort of modern glitches in hermeneutics that have come up in the last few years, is there any book you would say, that's it, that's the definitive book on hermeneutics? And the answer was no. Okay, so you have to kind of piece it together from these works. Now, the good news is there was some discussion. Again, this, you have to keep this right here, okay? Please don't, like, blog, uh, blog this or post this on your whatever. But there's some discussion about possibly that book being written because we need it, right? But that said, you can read reams of material about interpretation. And so I, what I'm about to do is a bit of a travesty because I'm going to sort of give you three main principles of interpretation and that means I'm going to leave a lot out that ought to be said. However, you can't keep all of those principles in your mind every time you study. Everything that's in Bernard Ram or everything that's in Zuck or whatever. So I've tried to, to sort of condense and congeal a lot of that into three basic principles of interpretation. If you want to study these principles more, read you know, the books that have been assigned to you. Um, G Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart's book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, has some helpful ideas even for pastors. Um, Biblical Hermeneutics by Henry Verkler is good, particularly to give to lay people for them to sort through some of these things. Uh, Protestant Biblical Interpretation by Menard Ram is, is another one you could add to the mix of what you have. But as I said, unfortunately, there isn't like one definitive book that, boy, this will really do it for you. Hopefully that book will be written someday. Maybe one of you guys will write it. Who knows? Um, but for the purpose of remembering all of them, I just want to condense them and, and synthesize the guidelines into three main principles of interpretation. And if you follow these, by and large, you're going to stay pretty much on the straight and narrow. All right, number one, interpret based on authorial intent. And I know I've hammered this. You've heard me say this every day, countless times. But why is this important? Let me give you an example of why this is so important. Christians will often come to the Bible as a kind of Ouija board. I've had this discussion with people in my church. You know, they'll come up and they'll say to me, you know, pastor, you know, my, my family and I, I had this happen. I'll give you a, a particular example. A man came to our church, just moved to the area, moved from Oregon down to Texas, just had been there a few weeks, asked to meet with me, came to my office, sat down, and he said to me, he said, um, Pastor, we're glad to be here in Texas. He said, God, God told me to move to Texas. I said, yeah, that's first like danger sign, radar, red lights. God told you. How exactly did God tell you? to move to Texas. And he said, well, and he launches into this explanation about the sort of secret message he received from reading the Bible. That isn't what he called it. It sounded more spiritual. You know, he's saying, I was reading and, you know, I just got this impression from the text. Well, the text had nothing to do with him, nothing to do with his moving from Oregon to Texas, but he, he sort of wove this interpretive decision out of it that was like, you know, you've heard the story uh, uh, from um, Ezekiel 8, 5. Son of man, ra raise your eyes to the north. About the pastor, who the, the young man who decided to go take the pastorate that was north because he read that text. It's like, God isn't sending like private messages to you in the Bible. Now, this approach, though, is very common looking for hidden messages for me in the words of Scripture that have no relationship to the context. Another is beginning with personal application before knowing the meaning of the passage. This is really common. How many Christians start by reading a text and saying, what does this passage mean to me? So many. If that's your approach, you can do it with any document. You can do it like I did with the Dallas Morning News. God can direct you just as well through the Dallas Morning News as he can through the Bible, if that's how you're going to do it. 
A text or a passage may have many legitimate implications or applications, but it always has only one meaning. Listen to Henry Verkler. The primary presupposition of hermeneutical theory, the primary presupposition of hermeneutical theory must be that the meaning of a text is the author's intended meaning. This is what we do, guys. This is how the world works. If you receive a letter, you don't look in that, in that email or letter for many different meetings. You want to understand what the person writing it meant to say. In the same way, the biblical text has only one single unchangeable meaning, and that's determined by the intent of the author. And that meaning isn't found in some mystical understanding of the passage. It's found in letters and words and grammar and the relationship of those clauses and phrases to each other. Jesus and the writers of the New Testament affirm this principle of interpretation. Matthew twenty two twenty nine. Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God. You have missed the point of what that passage means. You're not capturing the, uh, the author's meaning. That's what he says. You've, mis- you've mistaken. You've misunderstood. Jesus was essentially saying, you have misunderstood what the scripture writer intended to communicate. He's affirming both the fact that a given passage has one meaning and that single truth can be understood by the mind, which flies in the face of postmodernism because he's saying, you're wrong because you didn't understand. There is the capacity to understand. John 5, 39 You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. This is probably best understood as a command, an imperative. Search the scriptures. Jesus was telling them, keep searching the scripture because so far you've missed the intention of a number of passages. Search the scriptures because somehow you've missed the fact that they're talking about me. Second Peter, I read a few minutes ago, our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, so also, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which, in his letters, there are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do the rest of the scriptures, to their own description. Notice, Peter argues that Paul's letters are to be interpreted how? in keeping with authorial intent. And to come to any other conclusion than what Paul intended is to distort the Scripture. And the result of distorting the Scripture is your own destruction. Again, listen to John Calvin. I've I've shared this with you several times, but I love this quote. It is the first business of an interpreter to let the author say what he does say instead of attributing to him what we think he ought to say. This is foundational. Here's the heart of our job as students. Discover what the biblical author intended to communicate. Guys, this is one of the great motivations of my life and why I don't mind spending 30 hours a week studying God's word because I never want, either because of personal laziness or carelessness or lack of effort, to stand before my congregation and say a passage means what God wasn't saying what God never meant to say. Because when we abuse the scripture, when we make it say something it doesn't say, the result is not the scripture. When you misinterpret a text, what you have is not the scripture. The correct meaning of the scripture is scripture. So, based on authorial intent, I've spent my whole week hammering that into your head. But guys, we'll talk about it in a minute when we get to another principle. This is not where... Many Christians, even evangelical pastors are today.